So we're going to continue with the discussion of functional forms. I am going to have a little digression at the beginning to talk about one-sided versus two-sided tests, just because it didn't fit in anywhere else, so here it goes. And then we'll talk about the use of dummy variables and the way you can use them to create interaction terms in a model that allow you to compare slopes. And that's a very useful thing to do sometimes when you want to pull extra information out of a data set. So get a blank piece of paper and a nice sharp pencil ready, and here we go. So, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the use of dummy variables. And we have already talked about the use of dummy variables. You've used them already in one of your assignments. And we are, in fact, referring back to um, section 2.3.6 in the textbook. So, um, there'll be a lot of review in this. And I'm just doing this because I want to really solidify your understanding of functional forms, meaning how to write down a regression equation that pulls out all the information that you're trying to get out of the data set. Now, before I do that, um, there's a little digression, a topic here. Um, it, it doesn't really come up anywhere else. So I'm just going to stick it in here. One-sided tests. And um, so we mentioned before that um, when you are testing a null hypothesis, the beta equals zero. Um, let's say we've got, uh, we've estimated beta hat and we have its distribution and we construct a confidence interval and the confidence interval has these tails and each of these tails has two and a half percent in the distribution. So um, if our null hypothesis is that beta equals zero, then the alternative hypothesis is that beta does not equal zero. And if it's not equal to zero, beta can be um, positive or negative. So it can be, um, we could have a value up in this tail or down in this tail. So it's appropriate in this case um, to have only 2.5% in either tail. So the 95% confidence interval is we say it's two-sided um, and it has five percent in e in the two tails so that's two and a half percent in each tail and that's why when we um, have a five percent significance level for our t statistic we look up the 2.5% critical value. 5% significance level for a null hypothesis implies using the 2.5% critical value. So let me grab the textbook and I'll just show you. As you would have seen already, because um, you've done this before, if you um, have a large sample size, and you look up your T statistic and you have, uh, say, 120 degrees of freedom, um, the critical value that you're looking for is around 2, in this case 1.98. And that's in the 0.025 column. 
So that's not in the 5% column, that's in the 2.5% column. And um, so when you have that T statistic, you're looking at it, is it greater than 1.98 or 2, roughly? Is it greater than 2? Um, then you reject the null hypothesis. Well, sometimes, though, it, it's, uh, it's reasonable to say you only need to test in one direction. So um, what about testing the null hypothesis that beta is greater than or equal to zero? Um, so it might be that you have uh, other information about your coefficient that it can't be negative, for instance, or it's um, you're only interested in uh, testing whether it's positive. Um, well, in that case, um, we would use what's called a one-sided test. So then the picture is um, instead of having the tails either way, we might just be interested in an upper tail like that. So what if we've got 5% up there? Um, and so we... Um, uh, uh, this would be the case for testing beta is less than or equal to zero. Sorry about that. Um, so in this case, what if we're testing beta is less than or equal to zero? Well, then, if um, beta is large and positive, we would reject the null hypothesis. And um, in this case, if if that's our null hypothesis, it doesn't matter how far we go on this side, because that's all consistent with the null hypothesis being true. So um, we're not going to have a, a, any of the tail cut off down here, because it doesn't matter how far we go um, down that direction. So if um, we're looking at, if this is the, um, the t values, um, again, it, we can go as large negative as you want, and that's consistent with the null hypothesis being true. Up here, it's not the case. If um, we're just looking at the neighborhood around zero, um, well, if we go a long way that way, we're out of the neighborhood. If we go a long way that way, we're out of the neighborhood. But in this case, um, if uh, the neighborhood you can go as far as you like down there, but you can't go very far in this direction before you're into the improbable region. So um, so then we'd have the 5% upper tail. And so um, the critical value, 5%, we use the 5% critical value. And um, those 5% critical values are smaller than the 2.5% critical value. So in that in this case, for a large sample, it's about 1.66. 1.66 instead of about 1.98. So um, 1.66 as opposed to 1.98. Okay, so that means you could have a smaller T statistic and um, let's say your t-statistic is 1.7. So suppose t equals 1.7. Well, at 1.7, you could not reject this null hypothesis, but you could reject this null hypothesis. So um, t-statistic hasn't changed, but, but by changing the null hypothesis, we... Um, we've changed our decision. So um, when you look at the p-values for the t-statistic, those are the p-values on the two-sided null, the 
beta equals zero. But if you have other reason to believe that um, this is an appropriate um, null hypothesis, so if, for instance, you're not interested in whether beta is negative, um, you're only interested in testing whether it's positive, then you can use a one-sided t-test. And in that case, the, um, the critical value will be lower. So it, it's easier to reject that null hypothesis. Um, in our applications, we just use the standard approach of the 95% confidence interval, the two-sided test. So we're looking at the 2.5% critical values. What I mainly wanted to explain here is if you're puzzled about why it is that you pick a 5% critical value and then you look up the 2.5% or you pick a 5% significance level and you look up the 2.5% critical value. Well, that's why, because we're doing a two-sided test and that's appropriate for the null hypothesis of beta equals zero. That's our null hypothesis. You can depart from that neighborhood in either direction. But there are cases where you are interested in the null hypothesis that's in this case an inequality and you're, you only want to test whether it's significant and positive and if that's the case you can get away with using a lower critical value. In this case 5% critical value. All right, let's uh, let's put that aside. Now um, I want to talk about dummy variables, and if all of this is familiar and feels like you're reviewing it, well, that's a good thing. So let's look again at the wage model. I'm going to call it W, so I don't have to keep writing out the whole the whole term, and then we have experience. And we have education. And we have the male female dummy variable. I call that D. So um, D equals one if the person is male, and equals zero if the person is female. All right. So you already know that. If we have the wage regression and we regress on a constant alpha plus beta times the dummy variable, well now you should be able to look at that and see what it is that this is doing. All this will tell us is the average wage of the females and the average wage of the males. In our sample. And so we have um, alpha hat is the average wage of the females, and alpha plus beta hat, the average wage of the males. Why is that? Well, because if d equals zero, then w hat equals that's our predicted value. A little glare on the page there. Does that work? Maybe that helps. Um, if D equals 1, then our predicted value is alpha hat plus beta hat. Um, and then in the second assignment, you, so you did that regression, and then it looked like on average the men earn more than the women. But then as you added in other explanatory variables, it turned out once you add in experience, this uh, difference, beta hat, goes to zero. And then so then what it really means in that sample is you had a sample of male and female workers. On average, the men had more work experience than the females. So once you control for that, there's no male-female difference. It's just that the um, males in the sample had more experience. But when you compare men and women with the same education and the same experience, they're earning the same in that sample. Um, what we didn't look at, though, was do men and women benefit equally 
from additional years of experience and education. The way we would do that would be, um, let's write the model alpha plus beta 1, our dummy variable, plus beta 2 education, plus beta 3, and then we have an interaction term, dummy times education, and our error term. Now, I'm going to just write these out as interaction terms like that. I'm assuming that you know that if you want to do this in a program in R, you need an, a line ahead of time where you would have you would generate a variable. Okay, so you'll need to say something like D Eduke. We don't need the subscript there. Uh, equals D times Eduke. Okay, so you'd have a line in your program where you create that interaction term and then that's what you put in your regression model. Yeah, I'm going to leave that out just um, so I carry through both variables individually. Now if I take the derivative of w with respect to education then I get beta 2 plus beta 3 times the dummy variable. So that means um, for the males in the sample, um, the marginal effect of education on wages is beta 2 hat plus beta 3 hat. So if d equals 1, then the uh, marginal effect is the sum of those two coefficients. For the females, the derivative of wages with respect to education is beta 2 hat only, because the dummy variable equals 0. So when we have this interaction term here with the dummy variables, beta 3 now is telling us uh, whether males and females benefit from additional years of education in a different way. Drawing it, we could draw it graphically. So we have education, and we've got wages, and let's say we've got, um, that's females. And let's say that's males. I don't know in the sample whether this is how it would turn out, but suppose it looked like this. Um, so we've got the slope equals beta 2 hat. And here the slope equals beta 2 hat plus beta 3 hat. Um, so beta 3 then is telling us whether these slopes are different for the males and the females in the sample. And we're getting that all out of a single regression equation. We're not regress we're not doing two different regressions. Okay, you're not taking the, the males doing a regression, taking the females doing a regression. If you did that, the problem is you got regressions on two different samples and you can't compare the slopes directly. But you pool them together, males and females, you have a dummy variable for the males, and then you run this regression. And you look at the coefficient on beta 3. What's that testing? That is testing whether the slope is different between the two samples. And if it is, then that indicates, do the males and the females benefit from additional years of education at a different rate? Now, um, we've got different intercepts here. Um, the intercepts, in principle, what they're measuring is, what's the expected wage rate for someone with no education? 
and so we can get those out of the sample. So um, the females are that intercept term will be alpha hat, and the males, the intercept term will be alpha hat plus beta one hat, because that's this part of the regression here. This the the intercept, and by having the dummy variable, it means we got one intercept for the female part of the sample, and that's alpha, and alpha plus beta 1 is the intercept for the male part of the sample. So by using dummy variables with an interaction term, you effectively get to estimate two different regression equations. Now suppose that we want to do the same thing, but examine the benefits of work experience. We want to estimate, do the males and the females uh, benefit at the same rate from additional years of work experience? Well, um, so we're looking at males, and this time we'll suppose it looks like that. So suppose that um, uh, the two groups benefit at a different rate from additional years of work experience. Um, I'm going to set you a little puzzle. And then when I've, I've told you what I want you to figure out, then pause the video and see if you can write down the regression equation that would tell you this. Um, so I want you to devise a model to test if males and females benefit from experience at the same rate after controlling for education. All right, so you know what the data set shows, and this is what we want to ask. Are these slopes equal to each other? They may not be exactly equal to each other, but are they significantly different from each other? So pause the video, see if you can write down the regression, how to do that. All right, oh, I'm going to give you the answer. I assume that you paused the video. Um, so we've got our dependent variable of wages. We're going to have alpha plus beta 1 times the male-female dummy variable. Beta 2, we are going to control for education. So we want to control for the effect of education. And then we're going to control, and we're going to measure the... Um, marginal effect of experience and uh, we'll have this interaction term right. and then we have our error term now having written the model down now you can confirm that this will give you the information that you want and so here's how we're going to do that. So we'll look at the female part of the sample. So di equals zero. And we are going to take the derivative with respect to experience. So the derivative with respect to experience, that means the marginal benefit of an additional year of experience on wages, or in other words, the slope. So we're looking at that slope. When di equals zero, then, uh, well, so that term disappears, and all we have is beta 3 hat. So that's our estimate of the slope. 
in the male part of the sample, we will have um, beta 3 hat plus, and now we've got that part, so that's beta 4 hat. So beta 4 hat is the difference term between the two. So um, test the null hypothesis that beta 4 equals 0. That tests if the slopes are different. So testing here. Um, So we're going to check if these slopes are significantly different. And beta 4, the interaction term, that's that estimate will be what will tell us if these um, slopes are different from each other. Now, we don't know whether the um, difference will be females benefit more than males or vice versa. We don't know whether it's positive or negative, so we do a two-sided test on beta 4 equals 0. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Interaction terms allow us to have these more complicated marginal effects. They allow us to have, um, uh, in this case, different marginal effects within different groups of the sample. So we've got um, females and males. From a single regression equation, you run the regression and then you just essentially just have to glance at beta 4 and that will tell you whether uh, the males and the females in the sample benefit equally from additional years of experience. And you don't have to do these separately either. You, uh, as long as you have enough data, a big enough data set that you can support a model with that many coefficients, you could have education experience and then your interaction terms with um, education and experience. Both of them in the same regression equation. And then, um, so if we added... So that was our regression equation. Now you just look at beta 4 and beta 5. And beta 4 tells you that the males and females benefit at the same rate from additional years of education. Beta 5 tells you do the males and the females benefit at the same rate from, sorry, experience. And this one, do they benefit from additional years of education. Beta 4 is testing the slopes on experience. Beta 5 is testing the slopes on education. If these are not significantly different from zero, that means these slopes are not significantly different. Sorry. That means these slopes are not significantly different from each other. So if both those are not significantly different from zero, then that means the um, men and women are both getting increments of earnings from additional years of experience and education at the same rate. And now, from the applied point of view, the nice thing about this, this data set as, a, as an example of working through is it shows you why this multivariate analysis is so important. Because when we started out in that assignment, we started out with this. And for, for a lot of people, a lot of data analysis that you look at, all you'll see is a bivariate comparison of means. So if someone had drawn a picture, what they would show would be something like wages, and then it would be males, females. And so they'll 
say, oh, look, they're not the same. The, the female, let me do this on a new page, make it a bit better. Um, so we start out with something like this. Okay, so it looks like there's uh, salary discrimination in, in this sample. That That's males, not mules, males. Um, you'll see a lot of charts like that. A lot of times data gets presented like this. Just a, a bivariate comparison. Or maybe it's, I don't know, something like um, unemployment between males and females. Or... Um, income between the west and the east or income in large cities or small cities or some kind of comparison like that and it makes it look like the male female difference explains the wage difference but it wasn't until you ran the regression with the other variables the education and experience variables that then it turned out, well, it's not that there's a male-female wage difference. It's there's a wage difference between the more experienced and the less experienced workers. And in this particular sample, the males happen to have more experience. But if you compare males and females with the same level of experience, they are in the same. And the same with education, that you control for the effect of education. However where there might be a discrimination and we could check this i don't know the answer actually you guys could run the regression if you're interested maybe the males and females are are benefiting at a different rate from a different from additional levels of experience and education um and it might even be that the females benefit more from additional years of experience i don't know i don't know what the answer is um but that's why learning to do multiple regression and learning to write down a functional form that pulls that information out is so important because these bivariate comparisons where you just compare the difference of means for different groups in a sample, that can be very misleading because then it makes it look like the category has all the explanatory power, but it may be, as in this case, that category does not have the explanatory power, and that um, you see that once you introduce the other variables in the model. So, um, let me just look at my lecture notes. I think that's all I need to tell you about functional forms. Um, I could give you more examples. Um, uh, here's, here's one. But, um, and this... Uh, just to give you an example where it might come up in a workplace setting for you. Let's say you work for a gasoline retailer. And as a retailer, you're always interested in the relationship between price and demand. So um, you might have data that's going to let you draw um, demand curves. And um, so you're looking for something, you're looking for that kind of information, the slope information on the demand curve. But you might also begin to think, this doesn't, isn't necessarily always the same all year round. Because in, in the summer, people can walk, they can bike, they have other options for traveling. In the winter, though, people are much less inclined to walk and, and use their bike. So... Um, Maybe there's a uh, um, a demand curve in the summer and another demand curve in the winter. And the winter demand curve may be much less elastic than the summer demand curve. So how would you figure this out? Someone hands you a spreadsheet full of data, it's got price and quantity, and you also know the month so this is gasoline sales by month and they want to tell they want you to say can you figure out for us 
is the elasticity different between the winter and the summer? Because that could affect marketing strategies. Well, then you create a dummy variable. Equals zero in the winter, equals one in the summer. And then you, if you're going to do the equation, you wouldn't necessarily regress it price on quantity, but let me just say that we'll do it like that. Price equals alpha plus beta 1 quantity. Oops. No, we want to have price. We need different intercepts. Alpha plus beta 1 dummy variable plus beta 2 our sales data plus beta 3 and then our interaction term. You run that regression and that question that we were asked comes down to is this significantly different from zero? And our suspicion just based on the fact that in the summary you've got more ways of getting around that don't involve using a car our suspicion is beta 3 is going to be negative. So, oh no, I've got winter and summer backwards. So, our suspicion is beta 3 will be positive, meaning the slope here is higher. So, this should be a negative number. It should have a downward sloping demand curve. But beta 3 should be positive. So that in the summer, sales get more responsive to price. Okay, so that's... That's an example of how you might um, end up using this. Or if you go into finance, let's say you're working at a bank, they want to know how sensitive is demand for mortgages to changes in the interest rate. Okay, well, you've got data on mortgage demand and interest rates. There you go. Estimated demand curve. But now they want to know, um, is it different between... Um, people who work in the public sector and the private sector? Or is it different between males and females? Is it different between eastern provinces and western provinces? Any, any kind of category you want. Now you know how to handle those. Now you know how to set up a regression model that allows you to take the same data set but pull out more information than you even thought was in there. Okay. That, and again, just checking over my notes. Um, yep, yeah, that's it. That's all I need to do know this week. So enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll see you next time.